My name is Andrei Turinsky. I work at SickKids Hospital Center for Computational Medicine, same center as Michael Brudno, uh, whom you saw yesterday. Uh, my specialty is primarily data analysis and application areas epigenetics, epigenomics, uh, some of the uh, developmental diseases, neurodevelopmental diseases. Uh, so that's been my trajectory for the last, uh, I would say, about nine to ten years. And today we will continue the epigenetic and epigenomic uh, topic. So we started from the previous module. So now in this module six, what we'll do is we will look at the DNA methylation and how disease-specific DNA methylation data sets can be processed. So we'll explore the uh, methylation data, especially in the lab component. We will look for some interesting and primary questions such as what are the differential methylated patterns, loci, regions, uh, which ones are associated with diseases and to what extent. We will try to then see how to classify new metalomes and new epigenetic data sets into cases of benign and pathogenic prevalence into different types of diseases. We'll see what methods exist to, doing, uh, to do that. Uh, we will also look at some of the technicalities uh, that come very often in uh, epigenetic data analysis, such as uh, effect of cell type composition, especially when you're talking about blood samples, which are very common. Also, uh, how to deal with batch effects. And, uh, of course, we will do some of the visualization uh, component, especially in the lab section. So we will see how to present our results in um, publication-ready uh, figures and visualization models. All right. So to, uh, to start with the presentation, oh, okay. All right, so those were the learning objectives and uh, I will go straight into what the genetics is. So uh, you already heard the previous module about the nature of it. So I want to say that it's uh, becoming more and more popular in general culture as well. So it's becoming part of the mainstream knowledge that epigenetics is an interesting part of science in general. So this is an example of a paper five years ago from the Scientific American Journal. And the fascinating part here is that you have two genetically identical mice, but they obviously look very different. The color of their hair is different. And also uh, they have different prevalence for diseases. So the mouse on the left is not only uh, more yellow and also bigger, but it's also more susceptible to diabetes, to cardiovascular diseases, to certain types of cancers. So this is interesting because these mice, like I said, are genetically identical, but something there makes a difference, and the uh, difference is due to epigenetic effects between them. So of course, uh, epigenetic effects are not only in uh, mammals, but in uh, humans, and that is our primary area of interest in, uh, in medicine. Uh, in terms of what type of studies are out there, the main one by far is the case control studies. So the reason for that is it's the easiest, I guess, to uh, collect the data for. So it's easy enough to collect the uh, number of cases for a certain type of disease. It could be cancer, it could be some developmental disease versus MASH controls. It's harder to do it with uh, triors or with uh, families because it's hard to find appropriate families. It's even harder to do it for monozygotic twins, although there are some of these studies and usually they suffer from low power and small number of samples. Uh, so there are some prospective uh, studies where you have uh, uh, the evolution of epigenetic patterns over time. But primarily we will be probably focusing on the first case, which is the case versus control or different kinds of diseases compared to each other. And uh, to do this, we have uh, a plethora of packages and methods already developed over the last, uh, I would want to say, about a decade. Uh, so this is an example of several packages that address typical data processing and analysis steps with regards to methylation data sets. And specifically here, we are talking about uh, it says here 450k analysis pipeline. So it's a methylation microarrays that have roughly 450,000 probes. So in fact, it's 480,000 roughly, uh, but it's known as 450k Illumina microarray. 
And for this microarray, there are typical steps of the analysis. We, you know, we import the raw data files, the actual imaging scans of the microarrays, then we uh, process them, we filter them, we correct for the background, we uh, adjust uh, for certain types of probes, there are multiple types there, two types. Uh, then we apply a few more technical uh, steps, such as consider the cell type composition, consider the batch effects, and finally we come into the, the juicy part of the analysis, that is the uh, detection of differentially methylated positions and differentially methylated regions. So that is, uh, I would say, the primary outcome of all this analysis, from which on we will uh, find the genes that are potentially associated with the disease that we are studying and then basically speculate. So the black box at the very bottom says biological interpretation, so that is primarily what goes into the discussion section of the paper. And all these steps in, uh, before that are the methods and results, usually. Now, on the left, there are colored boxes, and they indicate which R and biconductor packages are available to do these steps. So if you, uh, if you notice the second one, MINFI, it's the orange box, uh, it can be applied to most of these steps, except the last, well, except the last two, right? So the last uh, biological interpretation is just interpretation. There are no packages to actually do that. But uh, MINFI package is one of the primary ones that we like using because it's powerful and versatile and it's well maintained. And of course, there are other packages. It's uh, sometimes useful to run a few of them and see if the results match and what are the differences between those results. Uh, today we will be working with MINFI package during the tutorial, so it's worth, uh, it's worth examining. Now, in terms of how we view the data, switching gears a little bit to the uh, data representation, primarily we are talking about tables. So ultimately everything is a table in which rows are genes or probes and columns are subjects or tissues or anything to do with the actual uh, experimental conditions. Now, uh, we basically can interpret this as data points living in multidimensional sets. So in this setup, the columns define the data points. So we have, well, in this figure, which is a mock figure, of course, we have three subjects living in a two-dimensional space. The two dimensions are defined by gene X and gene Y. So, of course, in the real world, we live in multi-multi-multi-dimensional space. So, typically, it will be in the order of half a million probes, 800,000 probes, million probes, and so forth. So, the space is highly multidimensional, and that's where our data sets live, so to speak, and that's where we have to kind of visualize them, at least mentally, and see how to analyze them. Of course, we can do the reverse. We can, uh, at some uh, in some steps of the analysis, switch gear, so to speak, and turn the tables and view the uh, tissues or the samples as the uh, features that define the data space, and uh, analyze the genes as living in the data space and seeing what the connections are between the genes, or which, uh, which probes in the microarray are co-expressed or co-methylated. So that could be useful once in a while. We could define uh, clusters of co-methylated probes and then examine why those genes are co-methylated uh, or co-expressed if we are talking about the expression microarrays. But for the most part we are dealing with space defined by probes and genes, or probes meaning the probes of the microarrays, or it could be uh, cytosine position, positions on the genome if you are talking about uh, uh, bisulfide sequencing. Uh, and the tissues or samples or subjects being the primary objects for which we try to find associations, clusterings, classifications, and so forth. Uh, now, of course, we are, uh, we have to deal with both supervised and unsupervised scenario. So in the supervised scenario, uh, sorry, in the unsupervised scenario, we uh, simply consider the geometry of the, uh, of this space. So we look at data points and try to find clusters between those Point. So in the first uh, top left uh, mock image, we will see that there is one cluster on the bottom left and a little bit uh, more points to the right, so we will define two clusters. As we collect more data points, perhaps we will refine our cluster definitions, perhaps we will find a third cluster somewhere upstairs. So, of course, collecting more points is always better. Uh, 
in the classification setting, uh, as opposed to clustering, our primary concern is not only to see the geometry of the uh, data sets, but also to find classes among them. So these classes may or may not correspond well to the clusters. Uh, if they do, that's great. That means the clusters actually are defined by the, uh, let's say, diseases or conditions that we are studying. If not, then we have some trouble separating those diseases and trying to see how to draw the correct boundary between them. Again, the same uh, uh, scenario applies. The more points you have, the better. So in the uh, bottom left scenario, you would see uh, you know, two small clusters, and it's easy enough to draw a linear separation between them. In the bottom right, if we, let's say, accumulate more data points and we discover that the third cluster that appears actually belongs to the disease rather than to the control. It violates the previous border between the clusters, so we have to deal with reclassifications and redrawing the boundary and perhaps rebuilding the models or choosing a different type of nonlinear models to separate them or, you know, deal with the problem as they occur. Uh, of course, another popular method is principal component analysis. That's usually uh, one of the first ones to just quickly apply to explore the data sets. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with it, but just to recap, we are looking at a, again, multi-multi-multi-dimensional data set, and we want to reduce it to something visualizable, to something that is humanly under, uh, understandable. So uh, the essence of it is just to find the dimensions of the largest variation, and then skip the rest. So we'll kind of reposition the uh, coordinate space just to make sure that the coordinate of the largest variation is aligned with our uh, coordinate axis, and then skip the rest of the axis. So in the uh, small example here from two dimensions, we go to essentially one. So we consider this data set and say, okay, the biggest variation is diagonally between the top left and the bottom right cluster, and that would be our main first principal component. And we ignore the other principal component. In the real life, of course, we'll have many, many uh, genes and probes, and from that we will reduce our space to just a few principal components and look at how the data actually uh, is visualized in, in that scenario. Uh, so here's an example from a paper that we published several years ago. Uh, this has to do with uh, methylation data sets of several mutation cases. In the KDM5C, it's a, it's a histone demethylase gene. So we have mutations. Uh, those are the data points uh, in red. And we have controls in some of the benign cases. Those are the data points in green. So we plotted the principal component plot, and we saw that there was a nice separation between the mutations and controls. And this is a good graph to actually publish and show. Of course, uh, there is a secret. So we pre-positioned our space accordingly. This was not at the initial analysis stage, where you are looking at the entire, well, in this case, it was 27,000 probes, roughly. This is after we selected so-called disease signature. We selected the specific CPG sites or cytosines for which there was a difference in methylation. So once you select those sites, of course, there's no wonder that you then discover that the two clouds of points are, uh, are distinct and there's a clear boundary between them, because the space was so positioned to begin with. The original data set looked something like this. So before we looked for differentially methylated positions, differentially methylated cytosines, uh, there was some overlap between the points. There was some promise as well. So you see that most of the mutant points, the red ones, are on the, on the left of the principal component, number one, and most of the uh, benign cases and con uh, controls are more to the right of it. So there, there is a promise of separation. There's a clear distinction between the two clouds, but it needs to be clarified, which is what was the point of the analysis of the, in the paper. Now, in terms of how to find these differential methylated regions, loci, positions, there are multiple approaches. So I would just point to at least three of them. Uh, we can do something like uh, running regression analysis. A very popular package for that is Lima. So on the top, you would see, uh, well, a basic regression model where your methylation at each probe is regressed along the disease status, let's say disease or control, also sex of the person is included, age is included. So you can then uh, separate the contribution of the disease, perhaps, to the difference in methylation. 
there are other alternatives. You can look for non-normal effects using non-parametric methods like uh, man whitney u <coughs> test or Wilcoxon test, uh, which accounts for uh, perhaps differences between normal distributions and typical distributions that have thicker tails. Uh, so, you know, more extreme values are more common in real life. Also, another approach to separate and to filter down the differential middle eight positions is by effect size. So, you can have a really good p-value, but the uh, actual effect size, the difference in methylation could be very small. So, those are not very interesting sites for us. And we want to, uh, we want to see loci and regions where the difference is really large, like maybe 10% is good, 20% is even better. For, um, uh, for global diseases like cancer, which really wrecks your whole metallome, the differences will be really large, like 30, 40, 50 percent difference in methylation and so forth. For something more subtle like autism, a 5 percent difference, a 10 percent difference is good enough. So autism is more subtle and heterogeneous in that, in that sense. Um, now, there are a whole uh, uh, like industry of making methylation software, of course, and I'll just point to this example of Glucor Omics Explorer software. Uh, it has lots of features, but essentially what it does, uh, what it does well, is presents uh, principal component analysis dynamically. So as you uh, drag your slider, you are essentially choosing your signature more or less stringently, and that changes the position of your principal component axes and the points within. So it's kind of going through that previous principal component plot 1 to previous principal component plot 2 that I showed before in real life. So you just drag and drop between uh, and, and slide between different positions of your principal components by changing the geometry of your point depending on your stringency for your signature. Um, now principal component analysis is one first perhaps approach in uh, exploratory analysis or methylation uh, data sets. Uh, a very common one as well is hierarchical clustering. So again, this is a uh, clustering uh, heat map from a previous paper of ours from Nature Communications a couple of years ago, where we looked at a Soto syndrome data set, that is the one in pink, and matching controls. Those are the blue ones on the heat map. Uh, all, of, all of this was done with blood samples, so whole blood. And uh, again, the idea here is to take your entire metallome and then uh, filter it down to signature, which is the differentially methylated positions, or it could be regions, and then those positions are so chosen that hopefully the heat map will show you the difference between the two clusters, the cluster of disease and the cluster of control, simply by the nature of the geometry that we chose, which is we chose the dimensions that highlight the difference between our groups, and then we kind of visualize it and uh, voila, it is there. So we find the difference indeed. If the clusters are not well separable, then there is a problem. Then perhaps all these groups are not as well separated. Perhaps you'll have some mixture between, uh, well, in this case it would have been pink versus uh, blue uh, points. So you will see some of the uh, positions are switching, uh, switching the region, so to speak, between the groups. So all those interesting, uh, interesting results could be found once you have the signature, once you have the differential methylated positions or regions for your data set. Uh, from the same paper, we can go a step further and we can use, uh, we can use these signatures for purposes of classification. So in the previous uh, hierarchical clustering model, as you keep adding new points, of course the model changes itself, right? So if you start with your uh, 19 cases and 20 controls and then keep classifying new uh, new samples and new controls, you add thousands of them, they will cloud and uh, kind of destroy your whole clustering structure, perhaps. Uh, in uh, classification models that I'm showing here, we are trying to preserve the model. So what uh, was done here, let's uh, walk through this uh, step by step. Uh, we found the metlome profile for the disease, in this case Soto's syndrome, uh, it says here on the y-axis NSD1 plus minus, that is the actual gene that is causative for Soto syndrome. So Soto syndrome is caused by the mutation in uh, NSD1, loss of function mutation. So we found the profile for the Soto syndrome. We found the corresponding profile for the controls. And then the question we ask is, if we have a new 
metalome or a new patient or a new subject, does it look like the disease profile or the control profile? So a fairly, a fairly simple classification model, really basic. We take the new person, we take the uh, differentially methylated positions that we found, there was about 7,000 of them, and simply compute the correlation. Correlation to the disease, correlation to the controls, and see which correlation is higher. So in this case, uh, we're looking for, uh, let's say, Weaver syndrome. So that is the orange uh, triangular points here. So what we did is we took several uh, patients that have this other but related syndrome, Weaver syndrome. It's related and clinically overlapping sometimes with the Soto syndrome. And we tried to see, can we classify Weaver samples as Soto's syndrome or not? So we took each Weaver patient. We reduced the metalome to only 7,000 positions that we found to be interesting, quote-unquote. And then we simply computed the correlation to the control. So as you see, they were in high 90s, so roughly like 95% correlation, something like that. And also correlations to the SOTOS profile, to the SOTOS syndrome profile. And that happened to be in a lower, uh, well, in the lower 90s or in the uh, actually lower 80s, high 70s. Uh, so clearly there was a distinction between SOTOS and controls, and the Weaver fell into the control profile. So there was a molecular, a molecular distinction between the two clinically overlapping syndromes, which was interesting. So we can uh, molecularly classify two different syndromes into two different piles, so to speak. Uh, just uh, recently, well, last week, in fact, we published another paper comparing two different syndromes. So these are two developmental and neurodevelopmental uh, developmental syndromes, CHARGE and Kabuki. Uh, CHARGE syndrome is called CHARGE because it's an acronym for, as you see there, coloboma of the eye, uh, heart defects, artesia of the clone, uh, retardation of growth, uh, genital defects, ear abnormalities. Uh, Kabuki syndrome is called because of a specific facial uh, facial gestalt, so you could see that the definition of the face is not exactly right. But the uh, well, the interesting part perhaps is that Kabuki syndrome uh, manifests itself slightly later in age. So the uh, the child should be about three or four year old to actually see the uh, clinical manifestations appearing. Before that, it's hard to clinically distinguish these two uh, syndrome. Molecularly. It is, there is a difference. So, uh, CHARGE syndrome is caused by a mutation often in the uh, histone-modifying gene called CHD7. Kabuki syndrome is, called, uh, is caused by mutations in two different genes. Uh, so, you see there KMT2D and KDM6A. So, one is methyl transferase, histone methyl transferase, and one is histone lysine demethylase. Uh, now, molecularly, there is this difference. Clinically, though, there are papers that essentially say that uh, there is a link between them, but uh, there was a patient which was misclassified, misclassified first as charge, but then later on during the development it became apparent to the clinicians that it was actually a Kabuki syndrome, not a charge syndrome. So, of course, there are implications to treatment and the prognosis and so forth. So our goal is to detect these differences as early as possible hopefully on the molecular level, before the actual clinical intervention is, uh, is apparent. Uh, now, what we did is we built two different models, uh, machine learning models, not as simple as the one I showed before for like basic correlations and uh, clusters, but uh, essentially there was a model that predicts the uh, charge score or uh, the loss of function mutation in the gene CHG7 that corresponds to charge syndrome. And that is on the x-axis. So on the x-axis, essentially, you are trying to predict whether a new, a new sample, a new patient, is pathogenic in terms of charge pathogenicity or not, or benign. And the same thing was done for the Kabuki syndrome. So we predicted uh, occurrence or pathogenicity of the Kabuki syndrome or loss of function mutation in KMT2D uh, gene. And then we tried to compare all our points uh, with respect to these two scores. So you take a new patient, you score it with respect to the Kabuki uh, score model, you score it with respect to the charge model, and you see where the point belongs. 
So the critical thing here is to avoid placing new patients into the upper right quadrant. That's where the legend is. So hopefully, well, hopefully no new uh, sample will be, uh, will be visualized there. And in fact, uh, none were. What that means is none of our cases or controls or uh, uh, other external data sets were classified as both Kabuki and charge. None of them had high scores in both <coughs> syndromes, which means that there was no overlap and we were able to fairly well uh, separate the two syndromes molecularly. So uh, uh, pathogenic cases for charge went into the lower right corner where all the red things are. Pathogenic cases for the Kabuki went to the upper uh, left corner where all the blue things are. And the interesting part is the model was built on the, uh, for the Kabuki uh, syndrome, the model was built on the KMT2D gene, that is the primary gene that causes the Kabuki syndrome, but we also have one case for this other gene that causes that syndrome, so that is the, uh, the KDM6A, the uh, histone lysine demethylase, and that is the little blue diamond that sits in the upper left corner. So a model built based on one gene for this disease was actually able to score well the sample for the other gene mutation. So that other gene mutation was also scored as pathogenic and perhaps, perhaps having uh, Kabuki syndrome. And that was an interesting connection between these two, uh, these two cases. Yes? Ah, uh, right. So the question was, uh, what is all that mess in the bottom left corner, right? Uh, so most of them are controls, and there are also some of the benign mutations. So we try to score uh, benign mutations and some of the uh, variants of unknown significance, and they also went into the bottom left corner with the controls. So for them, the prediction was benign or no pathogenicity, and though they you know, naturally appeared among the controls as well. Oops. Uh, we also did uh, the same scoring on an external data set. So we took uh, hundreds of blood profiles, normal blood profiles from GEO, Gene Expression Omnibus. That is actually a data set that we'll be looking at today, later in the tutorial. And we try to see uh, what can be said about them. So just to, uh, just to check ourselves. Uh, will any of the normal bloods from external third-party data sets will be scored as either charge syndrome pathogenic or Kabuki syndrome pathogenic? No, they were all scored as benign. So those are the green crosses that are shown in the, again, bottom left corner among the controls. And, you know, that made us happy, uh, right? Now, uh, previously all uh, these analyses are based on differential methylated positions. Now, as the microarrays become bigger, uh, there are more and more probes, of course, and more and more concerns about the multiple testing corrections. So the more probes you have, the more stringent your correction becomes, the more, uh, the more you lose, so to speak, the more results you lose. So, uh, and as we, of course, move into sequencing, you will have millions of positions, perhaps tens of millions of positions, and how do we score them all at once? And what to do with the multiple testing issue? Because, you know, applying it properly might destroy your, all, all your results. Uh, now, uh, a, an approach that is growing in popularity is to look for consistent, consistent regions of methylation. So methylation usually works in regions or blocks. It's not a singular position that is important. It's perhaps the combination of several nearby positions that uh, give you the methylation pattern. And so, uh, again, this actually comes from the same paper we just published in Kabuki and in, uh, in Charge. We would look for consistent pattern of methylation within a certain, perhaps, promoter of the gene or in some other uh, contiguous region nearby an interesting gene. So here I'm showing on the uh, top panel the methylation profiles near the promoter of HOXA5 gene, the homeoboxa 5 gene. So uh, there is a average line corresponding to the control profile. So you see the methylation for the control roughly stays around, what, 60% methylation, something like that. So the scale is on the, on the OI axis. And for the, uh, well, for the charge syndrome or for the CHD7 loss of function mutation methylation, 
uh, there's a clear uh, gain of methylation there. So each point that you see, in fact, each collection of points is where the cytosine is. That is the probe from the microarray. So for each microarray probe, we know its position on the genome, so there is a certain position, and we have certain values for our, you know, group of controls and certain values for a group of diseases. So we plot those values, and in this case, we see a clear difference. Is the, you know, you take the first uh, position there, the red uh, circles represent all our cases for the charge syndrome, and the green crosses represent all our control cases. So clearly. There is an, uh, well, there is some overlap, but clear, clearly there is a difference, and there is also a difference between the averages. So it's uh, quite easy to see that uh, the average uh, difference is maintained consistently throughout the whole region, and the region as well, as long as the scale on the bottom shows. And uh, the uh, situation with the uh, Kabuki syndrome is actually similar. So we take again the same methylation profile for the controls, that is the green line that is actually the same as the top green line, and the blue line is the average methylation profile for the Kabuki patients now. So again, each methylated position or unmethylated position, each cytosine from the microarray is scored, and we see again the consistent difference, which works in about the same way as the uh, charge syndrome methylation pattern. So we look at this gene and we see that, well, perhaps the behavior uh, all of these two cohorts near this HOXA5 homeo box is similar enough to indicate that that may drive the clinical similarity between these uh, between these syndromes. And again, the discussion section elaborates on that in the paper. Now, in some other gene, such as SLITRIC5, uh, the pattern is different. So the pattern on the top shows a loss of methylation in charge. So you see a consistent uh, region uh, bounded by certain other cytosines, but there is a consistent region where the difference in methylation is loss in charge, and the average line uh, shows the actual you know magnitude of this difference. Whereas for the Kabuki syndrome, the situation is the opposite. There is a gain in Kabuki syndrome, so the green line indicates the controls, and the Kabuki syndrome patients on average, are always higher in that region, in, you know, nearby this Lytric 5 gene. So perhaps this is a gene that causes the clinical differences or differences in the uh, of progress of these two uh, syndromes. Okay, so switching gears a little bit to technical discussions. Uh, all this was good, but uh, there are some problems that need to be addressed. So one of the consistent questions is uh, what is the right cell type, how to deal with cell type composition, what are the subtypes that contribute to the effects of methylation. And there are all kinds of problems that uh, may appear. So this is one of the papers that highlighted at least two of them. So in the top case, uh, think of it this way. You have two kinds of cells, and it's not the difference in methylation that is driving the difference between cases and controls. It's the difference in cell type composition. So if uh, the cell type A and cell type B are methylated differently but stably, there's no change in methylation. It's just that more, let's say, highly methylated cells are coming in and more highly, uh, well, unmethylated cells are moving out, so to speak. So the difference that we are finding is not difference in methylation. So it will be a goose chase to kind of look for what drives the methylation difference. It's rather a difference in simply the composition of the things that are methylated or unmethylated. And if you're dealing with a, a complex sample such as blood, uh, blood consists of multiple cell types, and of course these issues need to be addressed, and uh, somehow we need to somehow account for the difference in composition in blood. Or, of course, it applies to other cell types as well, cancers, and so on. Uh, another interesting case is you can have the same composition of cells, but some of them could be active and some of them could be uh, quiescent. So again, the difference is how do you measure the cell type composition versus what actual methylation you see in your sample. So again, there are all these problems with composition. Then uh, there are problems with choosing the right cell type as well. Uh, just recently, in November, there was a, well, there was a whole collection of epigenetic papers published, 41 papers, I think, at the same time. One of them was on autism, and uh, the authors here uh, found, uh, well, they took three different 
cell types in brain, so prefrontal car uh, cortex, temporal cortex, and cerebellum. And they were looking for, in this case, not differentially uh, methylated regions, but differential uh, uh, acetylation. So they were looking at uh, histone acetylation. And uh, they found massive differences between those cell types. So really, depending on which cell type you start with, your differences will be really, really drastic. So the top, uh, the top uh, uh, right table B shows you what the p-values are, uh, shows you what uh, number of uh, differentially associated peaks you could find. So it's really orders of magnitude different between different cell types. And, uh, well, they were sort of lucky or smart to take three cell types and compare the three. If you take, let's say, cerebellum, you'll be losing out. You will not find those differential uh, differentially acetylated regions that other cell types may possess. Uh, a very interesting paper came out, uh, well, in uh, just several years ago by uh, Raffaele Vizzari and colleague. So here the uh, concern is about aging and blood cell type composition. What they did is they took another data set found by another group and essentially looked at the uh, blood cell type composition and profiling as the aging goes on. So if I'm looking at, uh, let's say, panel C here, uh, panel C is sorted not by age, but by the proportion of granulocytes. So that is the gray bar at the bottom of the heat map. So as your proportion of granulocyte increases, you uh, can predict fairly well what age group the person actually belongs to. So the age groups here are indicated in orange, gray, and uh, green on the top, and they align fairly well with the proportion of granulocytes. So you can see the age actually shown uh, there, and uh, you know the granulocyte proportion rises and the age also rises, or well, vice versa. So the concern here is, again, if you simply take blood, you don't know what you're dealing with. You need to know what, uh, what blood composition is. So if the high proportion of granulocytes will cause you difference of methylation, it will not be due to any disease. It will simply be due to age, perhaps. And uh, they took, well, there are small errors that point to the first and the last samples in that heat map, in heat map C. Uh, and so in the, in the panel D, uh, uh, what these authors did, they took standard methylation profiles for six different cell types. So you see their natural killer cell, uh, CD8, CD4, granulocytes, B cells, monocytes. And they were able to essentially reconstruct what proportion each sample has of those cell types. And then the methylation of that, of that sample, of that person, uh, is simply a linear combination of your six profiles. So in the panel D, the uh, profiles are exactly the same as at the, you know, at the top and on the bottom. It's the uh, proportions and the numbers that are different. And so the different mixtures and combinations give you the difference between the very, very first uh, uh, person uh, in, the, in the heat map and the very, very last person that has uh, obviously a very different methylation profile. So that was a that was an interesting paper, and uh, these uh, authors actually release a package. It's part of Minthi, where you can estimate the proportional your cell types and uh, take it from there. Okay. Um, so uh, how they did this was based on a, another study, as I mentioned. There is a study by Rhinus, two thousand uh, Rhinus et al. two thousand twelve, I believe. Uh, it should be on the slide somewhere, maybe. Right. So what these uh, people did, they collected uh, purified cell subtypes for six individuals. So there were six, well, middle-aged, actually, individuals. And uh, cell types were purified for them. And we have profiles for each of those cell types. And this is an important study because, uh, well, everybody uses this data set. So it's used by many uh, other packages and studies that try to report cell type composition for blood or build regression models or more sophisticated models for uh, cell type uh, uh, deconvolution. Uh, so here we have roughly uh, 10 different cell types, purified or whole blood or peripheral blood, 
mostly different purified cell types like natural killer cells, B cells, and so on, uh, from which we can you know, extract profiles, compare them to your data sets, and so on. So an example of, uh, well, actually several studies that uses this data set and other data sets is by Hausman et al. So Hausman and, uh, you know, this group uh, developed methods to uh, predict cell type composition. So this is the one of the most recent ones where basically the, uh, the details are as follows. You take your uh, methylation matrix, that is the one on the right, where again, rows are your CPGs, well, meaning probes on your microarray, if you want, and Y are your specimens, okay, you, uh, well, Y is a matrix, so columns are your specimen, or columns are your observations, samples, individuals, and you try to see how to decompose this matrix into a bunch of profiles for your cell types, that is the matrix uh, M, and the proportions of those uh, profiles that each of the subject has. So essentially from the study of different methylation patterns in samples or subjects or perhaps tissues, uh, we are going to study of different methylation profiles. So we're trying to extract the methylation patterns for profiles for your cell types. And there was a big question of how many cell types you actually predict to have there. So we don't know in advance. You know, sometimes you estimate a certain number and you know, it's not exactly right, but the authors actually have a method of guesstimating or, you know, roughly estimating the number of appropriate cell types. And then from that on, you continue your study essentially comparing the profiles of your sub-cell types or cell types rather than the profiles of your original, uh, original patients. Now, uh, this is an interesting, fairly recent review paper where they estimated and, uh, well, tested different ways to predict cell type composition. They tested the uh, reference-based methods, such as the one developed by Rafael Rizari, paper mentioned previously. They tested the reference-free method, the one I just spoke about by Hausman. They tested several other methods, such as surrogate variable analysis and others. And uh, all, uh, you know, all tests are present. You can, you know, examine the figures and see the, see the results. The conclusion is that perhaps the best way to estimate these uh, cell type compositions and resolve them is to apply something called surrogate variable analysis, so SVA. And from then on, uh, this SVA decomposition, which is fairly generic, it doesn't actually um, stop at only cell type composition, it could find some other hidden dimensions, so to speak, in your data sets. So from that moment on, once you estimate the hidden variables or surrogate variables, you can use them as uh, confounders in your further analysis. You can use them in your regression models. You can say uh, that perhaps they correspond to batch effects or cell type composition effects or to some other, uh, some other interesting effects that are kind of confusing your uh, disease signature. Uh, and uh, like I said, the authors present several uh, several well, tests and studies, so from reference-based, and reference-based meaning you take the existing profiles for known cell subtypes, such as the one by Rhinus, as I mentioned, the frequently used data set, or reference-free, which is you basically estimate things using regression models and, you know, hope for the, for the best, so to speak, uh, surrogate variable analysis, various kinds of it, and some other methods that are, you know, have come up recently, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the comparison is depending on, you know, which method you use, you could be more or less uh, estimating the cell types correctly based on simulation data. Now, in our uh, studies, what happened is we frequently were asked, because we use blood, uh, did you find a signature that is confounded by cell subtypes in blood? So there are several ways to answer this question. Uh, one way is to go and estimate the blood cell types. You can actually take, you know, the blood sample and go, you know, use your centrifuges. I mean, I'm a mathematician, I'm not a biologist, so, you know, this is something out of my hands and I don't actually know how to do it, I only, uh, theoretically. Uh, uh, so the problems there, because I'm from Sick Kids Hospital, you may not have enough blood. So simply for ethical reasons or for other technical reasons, you may not have enough uh, pediatric blood samples to do uh, other steps in the analysis. So, you know, if, if your study 
uh, is based on the blood collected five years ago, let's say, you cannot just go back and, you know, recollect that blood because it's been used already and then, you know, use the purification and so forth. Uh, another approach, of course, is to do analytical estimation. So we can use methods listed in the previous slide, anything, to, you know, from Minfi to Hausman to some of the others. Uh, an approach that we found effective and persuasive, actually, is the following. We would take principal component analysis, uh, just like the one I saw, uh, I showed you before, between, uh, you know, the samples and the controls. So we take the disease, disease signature, we reduce our space to only those cytosines or differentially methylated positions. Then we add uh, the purified cell types, samples, into that space. So instead of comparing cases to controls, which are separate, we also compare the purified cell types taken usually from this Renius et al. 2012 data set. So the question here is, if you have your, let's say, disease versus control and there's a clear separation, is that separation perhaps due to some cell type being, you know, switching between disease and control? So perhaps your cases have more, uh, you know, more prevalence in terms of granulocytes or natural killer cells or B cells or one of those things. So is the composition in any way uh, affecting the positioning of your clouds? Well, in uh, this paper, this was again Chufani uh, Nature Communication paper, Sotos syndrome paper of ours, we uh, added the purified cell types or subtypes. We saw that all of them clustered with controls, so there was no issue that our SOTOS disease samples were affected in any way by the composition. So that was quick, persuasive enough, and, you know, uh, just several hours of work instead of, uh, you know, repeating your experiments or going back to the web bench and, and so on. Um, uh, and, you know, we found it persuasive, and so did the reviewers and the readers, I hope. Yes? That's particular for this disease, but um, in other disease states where you imagine there could be an inflammatory component, yes. you can expect methylation patterns, and while well, you can decon, you, you can create these clouds, but you don't know what cells they are. Very true, very because true. Because they're not going to match up to reference, especially if it's reference-free. Very true. Uh, that's very true, especially, uh, like, we'll actually look at the Down syndrome uh, later on in the tutorial. Uh, one of the examples where, you, you know, immune-compromised samples can actually have different composition of cell, cell subtypes. So, yes, very true. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, why are we talking about blood? Is it mostly an issue in blood or not? So uh, there are other issues, of course, as well. So think about uh, cancer sample. Cancer sample may not be pure. So you can have different, uh, you know, let's say uh, if you have metastatic cancer, you can have normal cells appearing in the sample, depending on how the sample was extracted, how the biopsy was done, and so on. Uh, the reason we're talking about the blood, the blood so much is because blood in the epigenetic context is one of the primary tissues to go for. It is one of the easiest to access. Uh, you would go for blood or buccal or saliva, and those are the easiest ones. Beyond that, you will need, well, autopsies or biopsies, so that is hard. And so many, many samples that deal with diseases try to look for blood because it's just lowest hanging fruit and you have, you know, abundance of blood samples compared to other kinds of samples. So in blood, uh, there was, I would say, more effort to actually look into, into this thing. And also, you know, there are lots of uh, applications of, like immunology was mentioned, cancer, leukemia, things like that. There's a lot of things deal with blood. So this is good to kind of, good to figure out. Add that Please. It's, it's certainly an issue in every tissue that's a heterogeneous, like has a heterogeneous cell type. We study placenta, and like there's probably seven to ten different cell types, and we're trying to make a reference uh, method for placenta. But yeah, we should consider it no matter what. And even in buccal, like you can have contamination with blood, and you sure. have a colleague who's done a similar thing and shown that the differences were because those. Buckle samples yes. were being pulled out um, yes. because they were contaminated with more blood than others. Yes, very true. And there was a paper by Michael Cobor from no, UBC. That's a sample. Okay. That's the sample, that's right? The, or that's the study I was talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Yes, in Down syndrome, exactly. So there was a contamination buckle and they figured out it's because the more sort of severely affected patients perhaps had trouble producing the buckle sample and you know, blood contaminated the samples and it was clear from the data itself. Yes, so valid point. Yes. Okay, another interesting, well, worry to worry about is batch effect. So these are prevalent, these are common, and more common than you think. <laughs> more, more, certainly more common than I thought when I began. Uh, so this is an example from, uh, I believe it's HatMap, and uh, they looked at the sequencing coverages over a certain year, and on the, uh, I think, y-axis, it's the day, the day at which, you know, certain samples were, were, were scanned. Uh, and, you know, there was a region in a genome, you know, the genome location is shown, one of the, I think, chromosome 3 it is. And basically, uh, it should be random, or it should be more or less consistent, but there's a, this streak of orange somewhere between day 243 and 254, which uh, basically shouldn't be there. And there's another little streak. So depending on which day you're processing the data set, uh, things may be different. And during the tutorial, we will actually simulate a scenario where there's a batch effect contamination, and we'll try to resolve it. Uh, all right, so an interesting paper here by Lee Cattol. Lee Cattol is one of the good papers to read about for batch effects. They're one of the kind of pioneers in developing these batch effect correction methods. Uh, so what they are uh, suggesting here is that uh, batch effects are persistent. They don't go away after normalization, necessarily. They might, but often they don't. So uh, here they took some samples based on a processing date, so that is, you know, day green and the day orange, so to speak. So they took the original data set, this is gene expression, uh, they normalize it using quantile normalization, so the panel B shows you, you know, nice, clean, quantile normalized, uh, uh, well, expression profiles, okay. But then when they looked at specific genes, it turns out that these genes, some of these genes, and there are hundreds of such genes, where you still see a clear pattern between, you know, batch one on day one and batch two on day two. So, you know, the green versus orange expression probably has nothing to do with actually days one and two, but, you know, the differences are there. So normalization, quantile normalization by itself does not necessarily remove these batch effects. And, uh, you know, they are persistent and clustering, subsequent clustering can still reveal them. Um, now, there are, different uh, there are different methods of batch effect normalization. There is, there is, well, the basic one is mean centering. So you simply centralize all your batches. So, you know, you find your mean for your batch and, you know, you, you, you subtract that mean from every batch and now your batches are all lined up. Okay, uh, that's one way to do things. There's uh, the next level of complexity, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's standardization. So not only do you normalize uh, by mean centering, you also normalize the variance. So you kind of try to put the overall profile together so, you know, your batches would match each other. Uh, then there's a possibility of reference base. So if you have multiple batches and they all have, let's say, controls, uh, you know that these controls should look more or less the same, right? So if they look different among the batches, then perhaps what you should look is for uh, difference from that control. So instead of looking at your, well, it could be an expression, it could be a methylation, it could be something else, some kind of measurement, uh, you would look for sort of, let's say, deviation from your reference or deviation from control. So you would know that batches may differ, but the deviations within each batch should be the same. So once you, you know, once you remove this sort of background reference, things should be comparable from now on. Then there are methods such as regression modeling. So essentially you would add your batch as one of the independent variables in your regression model. So your regression for your, well, it could be gene expression, it could be methylation, but in any case, your methylation now depends not only on disease status and sex and age and something else, perhaps some other covariates, but also on the batch as a covariate. So you would add batch, if you know what your batch is, as a covariate, and then hopefully your regression model is good enough to separate the contribution by that batch from that batch from the contribution from the disease status. And, you know, you crystallize your contribution from the disease status and, you know, take it from there. Uh, the industry standard 
and commonly used way is to apply combat. So I will not go into the details of empirical Bayes method here, uh, but I will just say that combat is frequently used. It's to-go method, and it's available. It's there. There's an R package called SVA uh, for surrogate variable analysis, and the combat function is provided, and we will actually play with it. So we'll play with it in the tutorial later on. We will apply it to some of the, uh, well, batch contaminated samples, and we'll see if it's any good in correcting for batch. Yes? What accounts for the batch effect? Is it humidity in the air, or temperature, or oh. chemistry, or what? So the question is, what is the source of batch effect? It could be uh, it could be almost anything. It could be, uh, you know, your dog runs through and spits in the sample. It could be, uh, you know, you hired a new technician. It could be almost anything. So uh, the uh, date, perhaps, is one of the clear thing to go for. So, if you, you know, if you, if you scanned your samples in October 2013 and then you scan your next batch in September 2016, look for batches. I would guarantee there is some kind of batch effect, simply because Yes, there's humidity, there's different reactives that were bought, there was a different, well, batch of chemicals that was used, uh, a different person perhaps processed it. So all kinds of, uh, all kinds of influences go like in, in this funnel that eventually comes to the differences between that and that. The uh, better way to look at them perhaps is to look for, uh, again, principal component analysis or some of those visualization methods. They are often good in separating batches or at least in pointing out that there's something very suspicious. When you're, when you're plotting all your data points, and then you suddenly see that, you know, batch one is all here, and batch two and batch three and batch four are all kind of patchy all over the place, and all together, or not very well mixed, uh, there is trouble. So perhaps this is the time to look for either combat or look for <coughs> what other, you know, problems and covariates exist there. Uh, so this is a, you know, it's hard to answer what exactly is there, but, you know, it's there. Right. So uh, there are several other uh, papers that examine which you know batch correction papers, uh, which batch correction methods are good or bad, or how they work. Uh, so there is this paper by Johnson and Lee, adjusting batch effect and micro expression data using empirical Bayes method. That's the one that describes combat. Uh, so here they would say, you know, you take your initial data and you look at the clustering. Uh, batches are all over the place. And you take your standardization, that's the one uh, I mentioned previously, you mean centralize and you also uh, standardize your variance. Uh, batches are still not entirely separable. But then you apply our wonderful combat method and voila, things are much better. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, the SVA or surrogate variable analysis package has been released. So there's a paper. Uh, there's a paper by Leek and Story, Capturing Heterogeneity in Gene Expression Studies by Surrogate Variable Analysis. So it has a lot of other things as well. It doesn't only look for batch effect correction. It looks for other hidden dimensions and hidden variables in your data. Uh, but among other things, it provides nice, easy access to the combat function in R. It used to be a little more cryptic. It used to be a, st a standalone function several years ago, I want to say five years ago, give or take. Uh, but then they brought it into this SVA package, and, uh, it, and it's there. So it's available. Uh, I think I'll quickly wrap up. I think it's 11.28 already. Right, so what I will... I'll skip this. What I will point out is the following. Uh, some of the batches come naturally out of your pre-processing and positioning of your slides. So here, this is an example of 450K methylation microarrays. If you process your slides in a certain way, it's better than a certain other way. So, for example, if you place all your, you know, disease samples on four slides and all your control samples on the other four slides without mixing them well, then you don't know if your differences are due to disease versus control or due to slides one, two, three, four are different from slides five, three, five, six, seven, eight. So, here, the study basically says if we position our samples on the microarray chips in the first way without mixing them, then you will find 94,000 differential methylated positions. And that is something to write about, obviously. But um, if you position your slides properly with, with mixing them, you'll find nothing. You'll find absolutely zero. So all those 94,000 differential methylated positions were actually spurious. And combat did not help. 
So they were after the combat correction. So combat is good, but not that good. It cannot fix your experiment if it's ruined to begin with. So that is a good, uh, a good uh, take home message. Uh, another paper, well, basically saying the same thing, that if you are not mixing your samples on the slide, look for trouble. So, you know, if you are mixing them, combat will help you to clear some of the associations between your slides and principal component analysis in your data sets. If you don't take care of mixing these slides on your experimental chips, combat will not help you. So the best methods are powerless if you are not designing your experiment well. And simply because this paper says batch effect and pathway analysis, two potential perils, I'll just say that they also point out that pathway analysis, this enrichment analysis that we love so much, sometimes gives spurious results as well. So they took uh, random CPGs from some random uh, simulations and they tried to score it through the ingenuity pathway enrichment analysis and they found all kinds of interesting patterns with high p-values. So beware. Beware of ingenuity, beware of uh, pathway uh, enrichment analysis in general because you'll, you'll find cancer, you'll find neurodegenerative diseases, you'll find some some other uh, cellular development diseases and so on, and they may very well be spurious. I think I am about to wrap up. I'll just point you to uh, an existing YouTube. So, you know, listening to me is wonderful, but there are better people who know more about batch effects, and one of them is Rafael Rizari. Just recently, he uh, provided a YouTube uh, tutorial or lecture. So it's about an hour, uh, overcoming bias and batch effects in high throughput data. I encourage you to actually spend an hour. It's a, it's a good investment of your time listening to a real, you know, true expert in the field how to correct for batch effects. And I'll just wrap up saying that, again, I'm from Center for Computational Medicine at SickKids. Michael Brudner is the head of the center. We collaborate, of course, and there are other people on the team. And on the uh, application sides, I uh, must acknowledge the Rosanna Expert Lab from SickKids who provide me with a lot of data and uh, well, stimulating conversations, and uh, we collaborate a lot on all these papers I mentioned before. Uh, funding, sick kids, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, and we are part of Canadian Centre for Computational Genomics. That's between Michael Brudno's lab here and Guillaume, who is sitting over there in Montreal. So we actually have one centre distributed to, you know, across two different facilities. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.